Hi there, I'm Dr. Steve Rallis. I am a primary care provider in private practice in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. I'm excited to share the results of my research publication, which is titled Optimizing Glycemic Control in Type 2 Diabetic Patients Through the Use of a Low Carbohydrate, High Fat Ketogenic Diet, or a view of two patients in primary care. Now, maintaining blood glucose or glycemic control is central to the effective management of diabetes. The tests we use to measure this in most offices, beyond random or fasting blood glucose, is hemoglobin A1c. As hemoglobin A1c goes up, so does the patient's risk for a litany of other diseases, cardiovascular events, neuropathies, kidney and liver disease, blindness, dementia, the list goes on. We like to keep diabetic patients at a hemoglobin A1c of less than or equal to 7%. This helps reduce their risk for all of these other comorbidities. What we very characteristically see, however, is a worsening of the patient's diabetic condition. And this is demonstrated by the progressive increase in hemoglobin A1c and with it, the number of medications needed to manage their condition. One drug gets doubled, becomes two drugs, becomes three drugs, so on and so forth. Consequently, drug therapy alone is generally inadequate in stemming the long-term implications and the metabolic deteriorations associated with this disease. So we need to help these patients change their diet and their lifestyle. This is where I think it gets juicy and is the principal motivation behind wanting to publish this case series. Established guidelines, including those recently released by Diabetes Canada, continue to recommend the idea of a carbohydrate-rich diet in the nutritional management of the diabetic patient. Diabetes Canada recommends that type 2 diabetics consume, quote, no less than 130 grams of carbohydrates per day, or that 45 to 60% of their diet should come from carbohydrates. Given that the primary pathology in type 2 diabetics is an impairment to their carbohydrate or glucose metabolism, I would challenge this idea. It would seem to make sense, at least to me, that if diabetic patients were to use a non-glucose requiring fuel system, such as that employed in a ketogenic diet, we would reduce the risk for some of the complications associated with the disease and potentially improve their condition. So we took two diabetic patients in our practice, a 65-year-old female and a 52-year-old male, and we placed them on ketogenic diets, which consisted of 70% fat, 20 to 25% protein, and 5 to 10% carbohydrates, and we monitored them for 12 weeks. The 65-year-old female demonstrated a 2.4% reduction in hemoglobin A1c over this period. She went from 7.8 down to 5.4%, which is considered normal, while at the same time reducing her diabetic medication by 75%. She discontinued glycoside and had a 75% reduction in both metformin and citagliptin. The 52-year-old male demonstrated a 2.5% reduction in hemoglobin A1c. He went up from 8 down to 5.5% while eliminating all diabetic medications altogether. I believe these cases demonstrate the efficacy of ketogenic diets in terms of improving glycemic control in type 2 diabetic patients and possibly lend support to the increased use of ketogenic diets in this population cohort. It's my hope that this research helps in some small way move the needle in the battle against this escalating global epidemic. And I hope that other primary care providers and researchers out there are inspired to look at the benefits of this nutritional approach as a potential first-line therapy. Enjoy the article and kind regards to all.